Today, I am watching Aurora Dimitri. She's doing a little book haul. And she's got some awesome looking books. As you can tell, she was just holding up Coleridge. Booktube needs more Coleridge. <laughs> Hi guys, Dane here. And today I'm going to be doing another episode of my Archive 5, I guess. I don't know. I'm doing five more reviews from the Penguin Mini Modern series. As usual, I will have the, the little captions on the screen and in the description below that will let you skip in to when the reviews start. Did I explain that really badly? I feel like I explained that really badly. The five books we've got today are... An Advertisement for Toothpaste by Rizard Kapuscinski. Create Dangerously by Albert Camus. The Vigilante by John Steinbeck. I Have More Souls Than One by Fernando Pessoa. And The Missing Girl by Shirley Jackson. So, without further ado, let's go. Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a quick review of An Advertisement for Toothpaste by Rizard Kapusinski. I'm pretty sure I said his name wrong, but whatever. This is book number 16 in the Penguin Mini Modern Classics series. As usual, I will read the blurb, so... The great traveller reporter finds an even stranger and more exotic society in his own home of post-war Poland than in any of the distant lands he has visited. And on the inside, we have this quote here, which says, Like rotting steaks in a forest clearing. So... Kapusinski was born in 1932, Pinsk, Poland, died in 2007, Warsaw, Poland. These uh, essays were first published in Nobody Leaves in 2017, translated by William R. Brand. Now you know what you need to know about it. I'm not too sure of the context of this when it talks about post-war Poland, when surely if he was born in 1932, the war ended when he was 13, so he probably doesn't remember pre-war Poland very much, especially if... He fled or whatever. I don't know. There's no introductory essay or anything like that in this to, to give that context. I mean, it's hard to recommend this over some of the other Penguin modern minis. I guess if you were Polish or you had, like, Polish ancestry, you'd probably want to read it to because he's a Polish author, I suppose. But over whether I would recommend reading this over the other 15 of these we've read so far... I'd recommend that over maybe two or three of them, but not over the majority of them. In terms of the context, we have an advertisement for toothpaste, Danka, the taking of Elsbieta, and the stiff. And my favourite of these was the stiff. It basically involved the transportation of a dead body. But from what I understand, these are all kind of... They're all essays, so they're all non-fiction. They're all based on what he saw when he went back to Poland after the war. The first two stories, I didn't tab out anything that was really worth mentioning. For the third one, for the taking of Elsbieta, what I really like about this one is the opening line. So it goes, Sister, I asked, why did you do it, sister? Which I think is a great way of kind of reeling me in as a reader. What I actually can't remember now is what the sister did, and I read this maybe two days ago. So I guess that shows how much... I really engaged with this story, I, and I didn't. <laughs> I do want to read this excerpt from The Taking of Elzbieta, so it says, He's already lived his life, this man with two heart attacks. He's done day labour and regular jobs and been in a camp and in prison. He and that tall woman had one child, their daughter Elzbieta. Elzbieta was born in 1939, a month before the war. The Germans put the husband behind barbed wire, and the tall woman was left by herself. She went out to dig beets. That work exhausts your strength because the soil that beets grow in is heavy soil. The mother laid Elzbieta down between the furrows in the shade of the lush leaves. She herself dug in the sunshine, out of breath and coughing. Her arms dropped to her side. In the evening, she made extra money by writing letters to their boyfriends for the girls. In the first words of my letter, I wish to ask you, dear Vladek, if you know whether your feelings pulse with the same sentiment as earlier. But if there is no lessening in your intransigence, then mine towards you is the same, of which I am informing you. For a letter like this, she received three eggs, and if it was a letter in which the passion was supposed to explode with flaming powder, then she got a hen. And then we have the stiff, which I did like. I'm going to read, uh, I'm going to read you the start of the stiff, I think. The truck is racing through the dusk, its headlamps, like a pair of eyes, searching for the finish line. It's close, Jezurani, 20 kilometres, another half hour and we'll be there. The truck is pushing hard, but it's touch and go. The old machine wasn't meant for such a long haul. On the flatbed lies a coffin. Atop the box is a garland of haggard angels. It's worst on bends. The box slides and threatens to crush the legs of those sitting on the side rails. The road bends into blind curves, climbing. The engine howls, rises a few notes, hiccups, chokes and stops. Another breakdown. A smeared figure alights from the cab. That's Zieger, the driver. He crawls under the truck, looking for the damage. 
Hidden underneath, he swears at the perverse world. He spits when hot grease drips onto his face. Finally, he drags himself out into the middle of the road and brushes off his clothes. Kaput, he says. It won't start. You can smoke. And here's just a great line of dialogue here as well. This is the last thing I'm going to read you from this. I read somewhere, Jessic says, that in the war, when the snow melted on the Russian battlefields, the hands of the dead would start to show, sticking straight up. You'd be going along the road and all you'd see would be the snow in these hands. Can you imagine? Nothing else. A man, when he's finished, doesn't want to drop out of sight. It's people who hide him from their sight. To be left in peace, they hide him. He won't go on his own. Oh, hi, Biggie. You alright, cat? Biggie, say hello to the camera. No. He's busy licking himself. Overall, I'm going to give this a 3.5 out of 5, I think. Purely on the strength of last, those last two stories, it would have been a 3 or maybe even a 2.5 based on the first two, but the last two really made up for it. So yeah, there we have it. That's what I thought of an advertisement for toothpaste by Rizard Kapusinski. One thing I've got to say before I finish is that when I was writing the review of this for my blog, and I looked on Amazon for an advertisement for toothpaste to add the image and the link and all this stuff, I got adverts for Colgate. I just thought that was hilarious. But anyway... On that note, thanks a lot for watching. Don't forget to hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Let me know in the comments if you've read this book. Hit subscribe for more, and I will see you soon in another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye bye. Today, I am watching Kit Kats Can Read. Hi, guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a quick review of Create Dangerously by Albert Camus. That's how I'm going to say it throughout this video now. So, this is Penguin Mini Modern number 17. I will read you the blurb. I've got to say Camus again. I'm oh, just going to say Camus. Camus argues passionately that the artist has a responsibility to challenge, provoke, and speak up for those who cannot in this powerful speech, accompanied here by two others. And inside we have, to create today is to create dangerously. So create dangerously is the main essay in this. We also have defense of intelligence and bread and freedom. I'm going to read you this bit here because this gives you some context as well. Camus delivered the speech Defense of Intelligence at a meeting organised by L'Amitié Française in March 1945 and addressed bread and freedom to the labour exchange of Saint-Étienne in May 1953. Great Dangerously was a speech delivered at the University of Uppsala in Sweden in December 1957, a few days after Camus was awarded the Nobel Prize in Literature. And this is translated by Justin O'Brien. I'm going to go straight into Create Dangerously. I think this is possibly one of the most well-known of these, you know, podden Penguin Modern Minis, and I would say it's probably one of the best ones to start with. So straight away, Create Dangerously. It begins with a reference, and it doesn't even spell it out, but it's a reference to the, the ancient Chinese uh, saying, uh, may you live in interesting times, which is kind of a curse. And it forms the basis of Interesting Times by Terry Pratchett funnily enough, and uh, the idea being is that you don't want to live in interesting times, because interesting times generally, uh, you know, for example, the Second World War was an interesting time. Do you want to live in it, though? No, exactly. And now we live in the 21st century when everything is boring as fuck. But anyway, so I'm going to read you this opening paragraph because it references that, and I, I just thought it was a great start to the essay. An oriental wise man always used to ask the divinity in his prayers to be so kind as to spare him from living in an interesting era. As we are not wise, the divinity has not spared us and we are living in an interesting era. In any case, our era forces us to take an interest in it. The writers of today know this. If they speak up, they are criticised and attacked. If they become modest and keep silent, they are vociferously blamed for their silence. I'm going to read this bit as well. To create today is to create dangerously. Any publication is an act, and that act exposes one to the passions of an age that forgives nothing. Hence the question is not to find out if this is or is not prejudicial to art. The question for all those who cannot live without art and what it signifies is merely to find out how, among the police forces of so many ideologies, how many churches, what solitude, the strange liberty of creation is possible. And this hits home for me as well in terms of... I was thinking recently, for example, Today, everybody is so quick to get offended by something that you have to be careful what you're saying to the point at which you self-censor yourself. And granted, if you're going to be Kanye and you're going to say slavery is a choice, then you are going to come under fire for it. But at the same time, for example, as a straight white male, I feel as though I shouldn't write any gay characters, I shouldn't write any female characters. Heaven forbid I write a sexual assault scene or something like that, because I'm a straight white male, so I don't have the right to write about that. And so, 
it comes back to this thing of uh, what Camus was saying in 1957, which is just as relevant now, you know, 60 years later, is, is that if you create something, no matter what it is, you're putting yourself in a position to be criticised for what you're creating. And it could be the most, you know, uh, it could be the most innocent seeming thing and somebody will take offence to it. And you just, as a creator, you just, I guess you have to go out on a limb and just expect that, you know? All right, we're going to get philosophical here with quite a long paragraph, so... So let's be realistic, or rather, let's try to be so, if that is possible. For it is not certain that the world has a meaning. It is not certain that realism, even if it is desirable, is possible. Let us stop and inquire first of all if pure realism is possible in art. If we believe the declarations of the 19th century naturalists, it is the exact reproduction of reality. Therefore, it is to art what photography is to painting. The former reproduces and the latter selects. But what does it reproduce and what is reality? Even the best of photographs, after all, is not a sufficiently faithful reproduction, is not yet sufficiently realistic. What is there more real, for instance, in our universe than a man's life? And how can we hope to preserve it better than in a realistic film? But under what conditions is such a film possible? Under purely imaginary conditions. We should have to presuppose, in fact, an ideal camera focused on the man day and night and constantly registering his every move. The very projection of such a film would last a lifetime and could be seen only by an audience of people willing to waste their lives in watching someone else's life in great detail. Even under such conditions, such an unimaginable film would not be realistic for the simple reason that the reality of a man's life is not limited to the spot in which he happens to be. It lies also in other lives that give shape to his, lives of people he loves to begin with, which would have to be filmed too, and also lives of unknown people, influential and insignificant, fellow citizens, policemen, professors, invisible comrades for the mines and foundries, diplomats and dictators, religious reformers, artists who create myths that are decisive for our conduct, humble representatives in sure, of the sovereign chance that dominates the most routine existences. Consequently, there is but one possible realistic film, the one that is constantly shown us by an invisible camera on the world screen. The only realistic artist, then, is God if he exists. All others are, ipso facto, unfaithful to reality. Perhaps the greatness of art lies in the perpetual tension between beauty and pain, the love of men and the madness of creation, unbearable solitude and the exhausting crowd, rejection and consent. Art advances between two chasms which are frivolity and propaganda. On the ridge where the great artist moves forward, every step is an adventure, an extreme risk. In that risk, however, and only there, lies the freedom of art. In that risk, however, and only there, lies the freedom of art. A difficult freedom that is more like an ascetic discipline. What artist would deny this? What artist would dare to claim that he was equal to such a ceaseless task? Such freedom presupposes health of body and mind, a style that reflects strength of soul and a patient defiance. Like all freedom, it is a perpetual risk, an exhausting adventure, and this is why people avoid the risk today, as they avoid liberty with its exacting demands, in order to accept any kind of bondage and achieve at least comfort of the soul. But if art is not an adventure, what is it and where is its justification? No, the free artist is no more a man of comfort than is the free man. The free artist is the one who, with great effort, creates his own order. The more undisciplined what he must put in order, the stricter will be his rule and the more he will assert his freedom. I'm going to read this bit as well. This is the end. This is actually the last paragraph of this essay. One may long, as I do, for a gentler flame, a respite, a pause for musing. But perhaps there is no other peace for the artist than what he finds in the heat of combat. Every wall is a door, Emerson correctly said. Let us not look for the door and the way out anywhere but in the wall against which we are living. Instead, let us seek the respite where it is, in the very thick of the battle. For in my opinion, and this is where I shall close, it is there. Great ideas, it has been said, come into the world as gently as doves. Perhaps then, if we listen attentively, we shall hear, amid the uproar of empires and nations, a faint flutter of wings, the gentle stirring of life and hope. Some will say that this hope lies in a nation, others in a man. I believe, rather, that it is awakened, revived, nourished by millions of solitary individuals whose deeds and works every day negate frontiers and the crudest implications of history. As a result, there shines forth fleetingly the ever-threatened truth that each and every man, on the foundation of his own sufferings and joys, builds for all. And then we have defense of intelligence, and then finally bread and freedom. I don't think I'm going to read too much from either of these. I'm going to read this last little bit of Bread and Freedom, because I think it's a poignant way to end. So he said, 
For me, our gathering here today is in itself a sign. The fact that members of unions gather together and crowd around our freedoms to defend them is indeed reason enough for all to come here from all directions to illustrate their union and their hope. The way ahead of us is long. Yet if war does not come and mingle everything in its hideous confusion, we shall have time at least to give a form to the justice and freedom we need. But to achieve that we must henceforth categorically refuse, without anger but irrevocably, the lies with which we have been stuffed. No, freedom is not founded on concentration camps, or on the subjugated peoples of the colonies, or on the workers' poverty. No, the doves of peace do not perch on gallows. No, the forces of freedom cannot mingle the sons of the victims with the executioners of Madrid and elsewhere. Of that, at least, we shall henceforth be sure, as we shall be sure that freedom is not a gift received from a state or a leader, but a possession to be won every day by the effort of each and the union of all. So yeah, Albert Camus, Create Dangerously, Penguin Mini Modern number 17. I'm going to give this a 4.5 out of 5. The last two essays weren't quite as relevant to me, I don't think. However, they still had some interesting things to say. They still made me think about things. And Create Dangerously on itself is like a 6 out of 5. It's probably, a, I, would, I would say Create Dangerously, the essay, uh, is, is a must read if you do anything creative. Whether you're an artist, whether you're an actor, a musician, a writer... You know, voice actor, animator, illustrator, fire and mold mitigator, pff, riot instigator, alligator. <laughs> so that's what I thought of Create Dangerously by Albert Camus. Don't forget to let me know. Sorry, Albert Camus. And don't forget to let me know in the comments below if you've read this book and if so, what you thought. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit subscribe for more and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye bye. Today, I'm watching PewDiePie. It is actually relevant, he's talking about what books he read in the last month, which is weird. Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a quick review of The Vigilante by uh, John Steinbeck. So this is Penguin Mini Modern number 18. As usual, I'm going to read the blurb. In these searing stories set in California's Salinas Valley, one of America's greatest, most humane writers explores mob violence, a disturbing encounter, and a bitter betrayal. So the quote on the inside of this is, Everything was dead, everything unreal. The dark mob was made up of stiff lay figures. So uh, this has got some stories in from The Long Valley from 1938. So the stories are The Vigilante, The Snake, and The Chrysanthemums. And I'm just going to take you through and tell you what I thought about some of these stories. So, so the vigilante is basically, it's about mob justice basically. It's about a lynching of a black man. And uh, it's, it's pretty messed up to be honest. So I'll read you this quote here for example. Um, In the center of the mob, someone had lighted a twisted newspaper and was holding it up. Mike could see how the flame curled about the feet of the gray naked body hanging from the elm tree. It seemed curious to him that Negroes turn a bluish gray when they are dead. The burning newspaper lighted the heads of the up-looking men, silent men and fixed. They didn't move their eyes from the hanged man. Steinbeck has this way of writing that he's very good at sort of championing the underdog, I think. And in this case, the Negro or, you know, the African-American is very much the underdog. I mean, he died in 1968, so he didn't really get to see what you would call our equal society today, although arguably black people get, keep getting shot by the police and, for example, education opportunities and all this stuff are not what we would call true equality, but I would say it's certainly better than, say, the 1930s, for example. I think here we get a great example of the kind of mob mentality or the, you know, the way people excused it to themselves. So, Mike drank again and then looked through his beer and watched the beads of bubbles rising from the grains of salt in the bottom of the glass. I was one of the first in the jail, he said, and I helped pull on the rope. There's times when citizens got to take the law in their own hands. Sneaky lawyer comes along and gets some fiend out of it. Mike drained his glass and pushed it out to be filled. Well, of course, everybody knew it was going to happen. I was in a bar across from the jail, been there all afternoon. A guy came in and says, what are we waiting for? So we went across the street and a lot more guys was there and a lot more come. We all stood in there and yelled. Then the sheriff come out and made a speech, but we yelled him down. A guy with a 22 rifle went along the street and shot out the streetlights. Well, then we rushed the jail doors and bust them. The sheriff wasn't going to do nothing. It wouldn't do him no good to shoot a lot of honest men to save a N-word fiend. And election coming on too, the bartender put in. Well, the sheriff started yelling, Get the right man, boys. For Christ's sake, get the right man. He's in the fourth cell down. Let me have a bit more I want to read here. So, Welsh sidled close on the walk. Nice gardens along here. Must take a lot of money to keep them up. 
He walked even closer so that his shoulder touched Mike's arm. i never been to a lynching. How does it make you feel afterwards? Mike shied away from the contact. It don't make you feel nothing. He put down his head and increased his pace. The little bartender had nearly to trot to keep up. The street lights were fewer. It was darker and safer. Mike burst out. Makes you feel kind of cut off and tired, but kind of satisfied too. Like you'd done a good job, but tired and kind of sleepy. He slowed his steps. Look, there's a light in the kitchen. That's where I live. My old lady's waiting for me. He stopped in front of his little house. I don't know, I just, I think it's kind of eerie, but really well done how, you know, Steinbeck showing them having this sort of day-to-day -day conversation while at the same time discussing the fact that someone's just been lynched. And, I don't know, it's a sad story. It's very dark and there's not really even any resolution to it. I think what it does is it kind of presents the fact as it's like a, almost a documentary of, well, this, this happened. And uh, you as the reader, are just, you know, you're invited to decide whether it's right or wrong. Even if the, uh, the, the Negro, even if he did do what he has been accused of, is the mob lynching justified? And of course, no, it isn't. That is not justice. That is not the American way. Or at least it's not what I understand to be the American way. It's certainly not the British way anyway. All right, next up we have the snake, which is almost, it was kind of creepy. It was almost like a horror story. It's basically this guy keeps this pet shop and this woman comes in and she wants to see him feed the, s the mouse to the snake. It did make me kind of sad reading it as well because obviously I have my biggie cat who is around here somewhere. I don't know where he's gone. He was here a minute ago watching me film. I'll read this out anyway. He brought a little wooden cradle to the table, laid out scalpels and scissors and rigged a big hollow needle to the pressure tube. Then from the killing chamber he brought the limp dead cat and laid it in the cradle and tied its legs to hooks in the sides. He glanced sidewise at the woman. She had not moved, she was still at rest. The cat grinned up into the light, its pink tongue stuck out between its needle teeth. Dr. Phillips deftly snipped open the skin at its throat. With a scalpel he slit through and found an artery. With flawless technique he put the needle in the vessel and tied it in with gut. Embalming fluid, he explained. Later I'll inject yellow mass into the venous system and red mass into the arterial system for bloodstream dissection, biology classes. I think as well this, this paragraph here illustrates the way that people kind of trick themselves into thinking one thing is different and I don't mean to be militant vegetarian or whatever but a lot of people do this who love animals but eat factory farmed meat and kind of have this disconnect in their head where they're like oh no it's it's okay because I need to eat it to live or whatever and and this guy has a sort of a similar disconnect here he shrugged his shoulders I see you want to watch how rattlesnakes eat all right I'll show you the rat will cost 25 cents it's better than a bullfight if you look at it one way, and it's simply a snake eating his dinner if you look at it another. His tone had become acid. He hated people who made sport of natural processes. He was not a sportsman, but a biologist. He could kill a thousand animals for knowledge, but not an insect for pleasure. He'd been over this in his mind before. Though all in all, I did really enjoy that story. I thought it was very sinister, but also interesting. I'm not going to reveal the ending as well, but it's, it's almost a mystery. It's never really fully, fully explained. And then we have the chrysanthemums, and this is about a man who, uh, he basically lives in the back of a van from what I remember, and he goes around and he, he does like, he'll fix your tins or he'll sharpen your knives and that kind of stuff, and, uh, and he meets this woman called Eliza, and they have this conversation, so she says, you sleep right in the wagon? Right in the wagon, ma'am, rain or shine, I'm dry as a cow in there. It must be nice, she said, it must be very nice, I wish women could do such things. It ain't the right kind of life for a woman. Her upper lip raised a little, showing her teeth. How do you know? How can you tell? She said. I don't know, ma'am, he protested. Of course I don't know. Now here's your kettles done. You don't have to buy no new ones. So it's just interesting, I think, how it examines gender roles, really. And then Eliza goes home as well, and um, Henry, she's talking to Henry. And Henry says, you, I mean, you look different, strong and happy. I am strong. Yes, strong. What do you mean, strong? He looked bewildered. You're playing some kind of a game, he said helplessly. It's a kind of a play. You look strong enough to break a calf over your knee, happy enough to eat it like a watermelon. For a second, she lost her rigidity. Henry, don't talk like that. You don't know. You didn't know what you said. She grew complete again. I'm strong, she boasted. I never knew before how strong. I mean, it's, I'm going to rate it. I'm going to give it 4.5 out of 5. I'm really getting into Steinbeck. I've read Of Mice and Men earlier this year and really enjoyed it. It was one of my books of the year so far. 
And I really enjoyed this as well. So I want to read some of his longer form stuff. And uh, I, I really can't wait to get to it. So if you've got any recommendations for your favourite Steinbeck novel that isn't of Mice and Men, let me know. And of course, these also came from The Long Valley, which maybe I'll get that story collection because then I can skip these three because I've already read them. So it'll be a faster read. Well, hey. So yeah, on that note, thanks a lot for watching. Don't forget to let me know in the comments what Steinbeck book I should read next. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit subscribe for more. And I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. All right, you're ready for some poetry. I hope so. Hi guys, Dane here, and today we're going to be doing a quick review of I Have More Souls Than One by Fernando Pessoa. And uh, this is book number 19 in the Penguin Mini Modern series. I'm going to read the blurb. Written in the voices of four different alter egos, these rich, strange and mesmeric verses by Portugal's greatest poet express a maelstrom of conflicted thoughts and feelings. And we have, of course, the quote on the inside cover, which is, but no, she's abstract, is a bird of sound in the air of air soaring. I think I read that right, I don't know. So, Fernando Pessoa, he was born 1888 in Lisbon, in the Kingdom of Portugal, died in 1935 in Lisbon, Portugal, which goes to show what happened to Portugal during his lifetime. I better read this little bit here, actually. It says, This selection covers poetry written by Pessoa under four different names, each with its own associated persona and style. Originally written in Portuguese, this selection is taken from selected poems, translated and introduced by Jonathan Griffin for Penguin Books in 1974, supplemented in 1982, and published in Penguin Modern Classics in 2000. I tell you what, let me just read you the contents, because it is a book of poetry, so I guess it helps to know what's in there. So he has uh, his poems as Alberto Caro, which is From the Keeper of Sheep, The Water Gurgles, and If After I Die. We have Pessoa as Ricardo Reyes, which is Master Serene, Crown Me With Roses, Apollo's chariot has rolled, the roses of the Garden of Adonis, the gods do not consent, the ancient rhythm, hate you Christ, I do not, the wind at peace, to be great, be entire, I want, and legion livers. And then we have Pessoa as Alvaro de Campos. And there, there we have tobacconists, I have a terrible cold, Newton's binomial theory, and I am tired. And finally we have Pessoa written, writing under his known, known name, Pessoa. So we have Dom Sebastião, King of Portugal, as she passes, Christmas, Harvest Woman, Why, Oh Holy One, She Came Looking Elegant, I See Boats Moving, There Was a Moment, Such Should Somebody One Day, Soon As There Are Roses and There Are Diseases. So, I'll give you a quick kind of overview of my thoughts on this. I mean, it's not necessarily the kind of poetry that I particularly like. Having said that, I guess that's a general rule. It was, it was fine. I didn't dislike it. It was so-so. It's probably not the best poetry sort of collection in the Penguin Mini Modern series so far. However, it wasn't bad at all. I'm going to read some of the poems that I marked out that I specifically wanted to read out to you as well. And this should hopefully give you a feel for whether you, whether you like this kind of poetry. Because, I mean, as much as I'm a poetry reader, I'm not the kind of poetry reader who will analyse it and be like, oh, well, he used villanelles and iambic pentameter and, you know, all this kind of stuff. Even though I have been reading uh, The Ode Less Travel by Stephen Fry. Don't read that book. It's really making me hate Stephen Fry, and I'm, I kind of, I would say I'm a fan of his. I've read about six of his books. Anyway, this is The Water Gurgles. It's a nice and short one. The water gurgles in the mug I raise to my mouth. It's a cool sound, says to me someone who's not drinking it. I smile. The sound is only of gurgling. I drink the water and hear nothing with my throat. Now, why I wanted to mention this is it has a date at the bottom, 29th of the 5th, 18. And I was like, what's the date today? So the day I am filming this, it is the 22nd of the 5th, 18. However, this was 1918, and it is now 2018. I, I don't know if you were aware of that fact, but yes. So I just thought that was interesting. It's been almost 100 years since that was written. Then we have If After I Die. If after I die, they should want to write my biography, there's nothing simpler. I'm just two dates of my birth and of my death. In between the one thing and the other, all the days are mine. I am easy to describe. I lived like mad. I loved things without any sentimentality. I never had a desire I could not fulfill because I never went blind. Even hearing was to me never more than an accompaniment of seeing. I understand that things are real and all different from each other. I understand it with the eyes, never with thinking. To understand it with thinking would be to find them all equal. One day I felt sleepy like a child. I closed my eyes and slept. And by the way, 
I was the only nature poet. Okay, I'm gonna read here, I have a terrible cold, and then I'm gonna read you a poem that I wrote about colds as well. So this is I Have a Terrible Cold by Fernando Pessoa. I have a terrible cold, and everyone knows how terrible colds alter the whole system of the universe, set us against life, and make even metaphysics sneeze. I have wasted the whole day blowing my nose. My head is aching vaguely. Sad condition for a minor poet. Today I am really and truly a minor poet. What I was in the old days was a wish. It's gone. Goodbye forever, queen of the fairies. Your wings were made of sun, and I am walking here. I shan't get well unless I go and lie down on my bed. I never was well except lying down on the universe. Excuse umpa. What a terrible cold. It's physical. I need truth and the aspirin. Do you like my French there? That was good. Excuse umpa. <laughs> Bonjour. <laughs> I sound like uh, Del Boy in Only Fools and Horses there. All right, anyway, this is my poem about having a cold. This is called Blair. The common cold has got a hold on me and now I'm coughing and sneezing and trying not to smoke a cigarette. It's funny how we put man on the moon, smashed atoms together to find the Higgs boson and arranged our lives around convenience stores, but we can still feel ill and swallow paracetamol pills. Now, I'm not saying big pharma sell soothers to boost their bottom line, but sometimes I think about Dickens laid up in front of an open fire or of Chaucer writing his tales with a big red nose like Rudolph. I don't need germs and the lurgy to feel broken and dirty. I've been cold since I left the womb and now my empty room leaves me feeling blue and useless so I'll wrap myself in a dressing gown and I'll try and get some work done I'll still be coughing in my coffin at the bottom of a hole that's cold and mouldy I'd breathe deep but my lungs would weep and fill with liquid here is another poem that I kind of relate to it's called I am tired for those of you who don't know I am a serial insomniac and my sleeping pattern is terrible I am tired that is clear because at a certain stage people have to be tired of what I am tired I don't know it would not serve me at all to know, since the tiredness stays just the same. The wound hurts as it hurts, and not in function of the cause that produced it. Yes, I am tired, and ever so slightly smiling at the tiredness being only this. In the body a wish for sleep, in the soul a desire for not thinking, and to crown all, a luminous transparency of the retrospective understanding, and the only luxury of not now having hopes. I am intelligent, that's all. I've seen much and understood much of what I have seen, and there is a certain pleasure even in the tiredness this brings us, that in the end the head does still serve for something. Right, I'm going to read this one last poem, this is actually the last poem of the collection, and then I'm going to give it my rating. So this is There Are Diseases. There are diseases worse, yes, than diseases, aches that don't ache even in one soul, and yet that are more aching than the others. There are dreamed anguishes that are more real than the ones life brings us. There are sensations felt only by imagining, which are more ours than our own life is. There's so often a thing which, not existing, does exist, exists lingeringly, and lingeringly is ours and us, above the cloudy green of the broad river, the white circumflexes of the ghouls, above the soul the useless fluttering, what never was, nor could be, and is everything. Give me some more wine, because life is nothing. I like that last line, that was good. Alright, so rating time, I'm going to give this a pretty solid 3.5 out of 5. It was good, it wasn't great, but I enjoyed it. And if you're into poetry, perhaps you may have yourself a new little poetry book to check out. So on that note, thanks a lot for watching. Don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read this book, and if so, what you thought of it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video, hit subscribe for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a quick review of The Missing Girl by Shirley Jackson. So this is Penguin Mini Modern number 20. As usual, I will read the blurb here on the back. Malice, deception, and creeping dread lie beneath the surface of ordinary American life in these miniature masterworks. And the quote on the inside here is, Miss X is walking the streets of the city completely alone. So we have here three stories, The Missing Girl, Journey with a Lady, and Nightmare. So I guess I'll just go through each of those stories and kind of let you know what I think. So this is my first ever time reading Shirley Jackson. I did enjoy it. I don't know if I was necessarily mind blown. The first of these stories, The Missing Girl, I kind of zoned in and out of. But from what my understanding was, it was basically set... It was almost like a Twilight Zone version of like the American summer camp, you know? I, I actually picked up bits in that that reminded me of uh, some of the Goosebumps books by R.L. Stein. So 
I don't know whether that's just that Stein was inspired by Shirley Jackson or not, or whether it's more that they both kind of slipped into cliche a little bit. It did feel a little bit cliche in that story from time to time in terms of some of the writing and the way the kind of story developed, but it was fine. It was okay. Then we have Journey with a Lady. So Journey with a Lady basically follows the story of this kid called Joe, who is uh, nine years old and he travels on a train by himself. He meets a lady while he's on the train, as you might have been able to guess. And, uh, and then basically at the end of this story, I've, I don't think this is really spoiler territory because actually the conversation with the lady is the point of this story. But at the end, he gets he gets home and his grandfather says, uh, "Have a good trip. Anything happen?" And he says, "Saw a boy sitting on a fence. I didn't wave to him though." So he kind of ad admits that he met this lady. So uh, I'm just going to finish with Nightmare. And Nightmare was actually my favourite story of this collection. It's basically about this this kind of. I think it's set, it's set in New York City and the, the character is Miss X and it's what this, this quote from the start was from. And basically a car is driving around there, all these posters up and it's all on the radio, you know, find Miss X and say to her, you're Miss X and then you win a prize. And um, she starts to panic about it. Basically they're clearly talking about her as well and even as she tries to change things, so she takes her gloves off and they update what they're saying based on what she's done. And she kind of can't get away. It's just sinister. It's a sinister story, you know. Anyway, I'm going to read this paragraph. Now that she was aware of it, she noticed that there were Find Miss X posters on every lamppost. They were all like the one in the newsstand, with the words running smaller and smaller and in different colours. She was walking along a busy street, and she lingered past the shop windows, looking at jewellery and custom-made shoes. She saw a hat, something like her own, in a window of a store so expensive that only the hat lay in the window, soft against a fold of orange silk. Mine is almost the same, she thought as she turned away, and it cost only four ninety eight. Because she lingered, the sound truck caught up with her. She heard it from a distance, forcing its way through the taxis and trucks in the street, its loudspeaker blaring music, something military. Then the announcer's voice began again. Find Miss X, find Miss X, win $50,000 in cash. Miss X is walking the streets of the city today alone. She is wearing a blue hat with a red feather, a reddish tweed top coat and blue shoes. She is carrying a blue pocketbook and a large package. Listen carefully, Miss X is carrying a large package. Find Miss X, find Miss X, walk right up to her and say, you are Miss X and win a new home in any city in the world with a town car and chauffeur, win all these magnificent prizes. That's all I'm going to read to you from that story, but it did. I found it genuinely unsettling because I've had dreams like that, weirdly enough. So I don't know whether it's just that she's tapped into this like common, you know, human condition. I, I, it's really, really odd. I mean, I'm just trying to check. She died in 1965. All in all, it was okay. I'm going to give it a 3.5 out of 5. It was alright. I'm in no rush to get to any more Shirley Jackson, but having heard so many things, so many good things about her books, I'm sure I will do at some point. And, um, yeah, it was alright. So there we have it. That's what I thought of The Missing Girl by Shirley Jackson. Don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read this, and if so, what you thought. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit subscribe for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.